Good morning. I'm sorry that I can't be here with you personally today, but I'm glad that I can join you digitally. And I appreciate the prayers over the weekend for my grandmother and as I was helping to conduct her funeral. This morning we're going to continue our sermon series on the five solas. So far we've looked at sola scriptura, which is the idea that all of our faith and practice comes from scripture alone. We then moved on to sola gratia, that from the scripture we came to understand that all we have from our initial existence, from our first birth, to our being born again is by the grace of God. And last week we talked about sola fide, that we receive that grace by faith alone. Today we come to the question of faith in what? And we come to the sola that we call solus Christus, by Christ alone. So from scripture we see that our salvation is by grace alone, which is by faith alone, in Christ alone. But before we get into the sermon today, we're going to do a bio again, like we've done the other weeks. And today we're going to be looking at someone who we say was part of the second generation of reformers. His name was Heinrich Bullinger. And he was born a little bit later than the other reformers we've looked at. Born on July 18th, 1504. So he was only 13 years old when Luther published his 95 Thesis. And yet he is the most influential of the second generation of reformers. Bullinger was born in a small, you might even say a tiny town, just 10 miles west of Zurich called Bermgarten. Bullinger's father was a Roman Catholic priest. Now if you think about that, you realize that Roman Catholic priests weren't allowed to get married. Well, he was actually living in a common law marriage. And he received a special permission to have a common law wife by the bishop, by paying his bishop tribute every month. Now, with these types of practices going on, you can understand why many of these reformers at the time felt like there was change that needed to happen in the church. The church professed on the one hand that you're not allowed to get married if you're a priest. But then on the other hand, they took money if you were willing to pay them off to break the rules. So, Heinrich Bullinger's father, who was Heinrich Bullinger Sr., was the local parish priest of Bermgarten. And Heinrich Jr. was the fifth child of his parents. He was raised from the beginning to be a priest. His father had expected him to follow in his footsteps. And so he was sent to a monastic school at Emmerich, where he studied a variety of things but primarily became proficient in Latin, which was the language that the church used at the time. Then in 1519, at the age of just 15, Bullinger was sent to the University of Cologne. Now 1519. That was just two years after Martin Luther published his 95 Thesis. So the Reformation is just beginning to get going. But Cologne was the largest city in all of Germany at the time, and it was a strong bastion for the Roman Catholic Church. While Bullinger was there, he studied the uh, Church Fathers, such as Ambrose, Chrysostom, and Augustine. And their focus on Scripture caused Bullinger to want to read the Bible for himself. Now this may sound odd to us today. We think, well, of course, he's studying to be a priest. He would read the Bible for himself. But that simply was not common before the Reformation. At this point in the church's history, you were trained to be a priest without having to study the Bible for yourself. As a matter of fact, Bullinger himself later said that the idea of studying the Bible for oneself was largely unheard of by his fellow students. So here's Bullinger reading the church fathers, and he begins to then read the Bible for himself. And he begins to realize that his views that he's getting from Scripture are somewhat different than some of the things he's being taught within the church. Now while this is going on, Martin Luther's reputation is becoming more famous, or in Cologne, more infamous. And they begin to have public book burnings of Martin Luther's books. Well this does to Bullinger what it would do to any teenage boy. It piques his interest. 
wonders, what in the world is Martin Luther saying that's so interesting that it has to be burned? And so he begins to read Luther. And that begins to challenge his thinking more than anything else he's read so far. But it resonates with him. It resonates with what he's already beginning to believe. He then also reads a book in 1521, so now we're four years past the publication of the 95 Thesis, and it was written by Luther's friend, Philip Mel Melanchthon. Now Melanchthon was a colleague of Luther's, and he wrote this book, and it laid out what we might call the basic theology of Lutheranism at the time. And so, at the age of just 17, while studying in Cologne, Bullinger embraced the truth that justification is by grace alone, by faith alone, in Christ alone. Then in 1522, the year that he turned 18, Bullinger had earned a master's degree and returned home to Bermgarten. The following year, he became the head teacher at a convent in Capel. For the next six years, he instructed the local monks in the New Testament and replaced the Mass with a Protestant worship service. During this time, in 1527, he took a five-month leave to go to Zurich. In Zurich, he heard Zwingli, who we talked about last week. He heard Zwingli teaching, and he got to meet Zwingli in person. This sparked a relationship that they would continue until Zwingli's death. As a matter of fact, after this point, he would take a trip every year to Zurich to take a retreat, you might say, and spend time with Zwingli discussing theology. Now, two years after that initial meeting in 1529, Bullinger's father publicly embraced the Reformation. He was still the parish priest there in Bermgarten. And he tried to then begin to reform his own church. But his parishioners resisted, and he was forced to resign. But he was, because he had embraced the Reformation and he had left the Roman Catholic Church at that point, able to formalize his marriage to his wife of all those years. Now, like I've said before, we haven't had a lot of time to discuss, but the Reformation did have motivations beyond just theology for some people. Now, what's really odd is after the church forces Bullinger Sr. out of the pulpit, out of the pastorate, and all the turmoil that comes along with that, and a very strange turn of events, the next pastor they call is Bullinger Jr., his son. So Bullinger becomes the local parish priest of his home church, who had kicked his father out for trying to reform them. But Bullinger himself, Bullinger Jr., who we're talking about today, is far more the stronger reformer than his father. And yet they call him in to be the local parish priest. And so he works there to reform the church and reform the town. This goes on for two years until 1531. In 1531, as we talked about last week in the life of Zwingli, Zurich comes under attack from five Catholic cantons. So these are Catholic states or provinces in Switzerland that it's decide to attack Zurich because it's Protestant. And at that, during that time, in that fighting, it's when Zwingli died on the battlefield as a chaplain. The Catholic forces overwhelmed the Protestant ones, and Zurich had to sign an unfavorable peace accord. At that point, some of the other regions around Zurich returned to Catholicism, including Bermgarten, where Bullinger was a pastor. So at that point, his own life was being threatened. He had to flee, and he fled to Zurich because he knew that would be a safe place for him. Three days after arriving in Zurich, parishioners at the cathedral, where Zwingli had been the pastor, asked Bullinger if he would preach for them. And so he fills the pulpit and does such a fantastic job that the parishioners feel that he is very much like Zwingli himself. As a matter of fact, one of the parishioners exclaimed, Like the phoenix, he has risen from the ashes saying that basically Bullinger was a second coming of Zwingli. And so, at just 27 years old, the city council of Zurich elected Heinrich Bullinger to succeed Zwingli as the chief minister of the city. Now remember, while they were Protestant, there was still a very tight connection between church and state. So church and city government. We talked about that with Zwingli's life as well last week. So the city council approves and hires Bullinger to be the chief minister for the city. In this role, he not only preached at the cathedral, 
But he also oversaw the other churches in the canton, in the Zurich province, if you will, giving Bullinger a very wide and large influence. He served in this position for 44 years until his death. During this time, it is estimated that he preached over 7,000 sermons and wrote so much during his life that the volume of his writing exceeded Luther, Calvin, and Zwingli combined. So you can see what an incredible impact he had not only in his life, but through his writing in the centuries that followed. He was not only a great teacher, but he also opened his home to orphans and refugees, receiving many persecuted believers, fleeing Mary Tudor in England. He did take a wife, and they had 11 children of their own, as well as adopting many other children. So right there you can see it, his commitment to spreading the ideas of the Reformation happened within his own family. And as a matter of fact, all of his sons became Protestant ministers. Now he also received many persecuted Christians who came from England fleeing Mary Tudor. Many of them later returned home once it was safe and became influential English Puritans. Bullinger also communicated with many reformed leaders such as John Calvin as well as English royalty who would consult with him such as Edward VI and Elizabeth I. So broad was his impact that Theodore Beza who in many ways was the, was the successor to John Calvin, called Bullinger the common shepherd of all Christian churches. So we can see from the life of Heinrich Bullinger the impact that these ideas had on him that he spread and the impact that the idea of solus Christus had. That it was Christ alone who deserved to be glorified. And yet, as he had looked at the church that he was in in the day, he saw many other things being glorified and people putting their faith and trust in things other than Christ. There were many other ideas and people, whether it was Mary, who deserves to be honored, but not to be deified, or saints, who also serve as great examples for us in our lives today, but also shouldn't be deified. The role that the Pope played, the role that local kings played. He looked at this and he saw people putting their faith and trust and their beliefs in other things and other ideas and not in Christ alone. So where do we get this idea of solus Christus? Of Christ alone? Well, as you can guess from our past weeks, we find it throughout Scripture. And we can go all the way back to the book of Genesis. Now one of the things that bothers me Sometimes I hear Christians remark or, or repeat the idea that now that we have the New Testament, we no longer need the Old Testament. But nothing can be further from the truth. The entire Bible, the whole counsel of the Word of God, points to Christ, to Solus Christus, to Christ alone. The whole Bible is the story of Jesus. And so what I want to do this morning is look at a few passages that illustrate this point, how everything points to Jesus. And that ultimately, our entire faith and practice of our faith goes back to Christ alone. Ultimately, being a Christian is not about subscribing to a religion or religious order. It's about having faith in Christ. And so what I want to do is go back to the book of Genesis. So if you want to open your Bibles to Genesis chapter 2, we're going to pray. And then I want to read verses 8 and 9, as well as verses 16 and 17. God, we thank you for the chance to come and look at your scripture and how the Bible, though written by many different authors, recorded by many different authors, and written over the centuries, yet there's a common crimson thread that runs throughout it, and that's the blood of Christ. We see his story, everything pointing to him, whether it's forward to him from the Old Testament or back at him in the New Testament, that all of history... Really, he is the crux, the climax of the entire story. We pray this morning that you would enlighten us to better understand this concept and that you would help us to make sure that our faith is firmly in Christ alone, not in ourselves and our good works, not in the faith of our parents or of other people, but that it's in Christ alone. We pray that in Jesus' name this morning. Amen. So reading from Genesis chapter 2, starting in verse 8. 
And the Lord God planted a garden in Eden, in the east, and there he put the man whom he had formed. And out of the ground the Lord God made to spring up every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life was in the midst of the garden, and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And if we skip to verse 16 and 17, And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, You may surely eat of every tree in the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat of it you shall surely die. So here in Genesis, we see God has planted a garden, and we see three varieties of plants. We see there's a whole lot of plants that are good for eating. God says that what he's created is very good. But there's two specific trees. So there's the tree of life, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and there's a lot of other plants. Now between these two trees, there's one that they can eat of, the tree of life. And they receive the grace of God. They receive the ability to continue living, to stay healthy forever. But then on the other hand, there's the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Now often when we talk about this tree, we talk about the impact that it has when you eat it. The immediate impact that they were cut off from God and the, the fact that it meant they would die. But there's more to it than that. You see, they had a choice. They had a choice there in the garden. If they wanted to eat of the tree of life and have faith in God and trust Him with their lives, or to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Now when the serpent told them, and told Eve that if she ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, that she would be like God, he wasn't completely lying. He was misrepresenting the truth. As most believable lies are, they're really a perversion of truth. There was some truth to the idea that she would become like God, knowing good from evil. As a matter of fact, after Adam and Eve ate of the fruit, God himself says that they have become like us, knowing good and evil. So in a way, when we ate of the fruit, we did become like God, or a little bit more like God, in having that knowledge of good and evil. But we also became less like God in that we left, lost our holiness and our righteousness. So there they are with that choice to eat of the knowledge of good and evil so they could know. So they could know what was good and bad. The problem is with knowledge comes responsibility. Once they'd eaten of the tree, they had the responsibility to keep themselves holy, to live a perfect life, to not sin. And we know that all of us have sinned. All of us have fallen short of that. If they had just eaten of the tree of life, they could have just by faith received God's grace. Do you see that the tree of life and the tree of knowledge of good and evil was a choice between grace and works? It was a choice between trusting God and having faith or trusting in ourselves and wanting to be in control. It was being a choice between being cared for by God or wanting to be God. So the tree of life points to Jesus. All the way back from Genesis, we see the story is pointing toward Jesus. That there was this one who would come from whom we would receive grace and life, not based on our own works, our own abilities, but based on His grace. Now we also know in the garden there were other plants that they could eat, and those were good. And in the same way, there's many other good things in life. We can talk about the saints, we can talk, which saints is all of us, anyone who's a Christian is a saint, but godly people who have gone before. We can talk about Mary as one of those people, but not deify them, not pray to them, and not give them the glory, nor put our faith in them. So when we say solus Christus, we're not saying that, that there's nothing else besides Christ, but we're saying that everything is under his feet. Everything is subservient to Christ. Just like in the garden, that other plants they could have eaten were good, but it was the tree of life that was going to give them eternal life. And in the same way, there can be many good things we find in the world, but our faith has to be holy and only in Christ. And the glory goes only to Christ. And so from Genesis, the tree of life points to Jesus. Now if we move to the next book in the Bible, and don't worry, we're not going to go through every book in the Bible, but if we look at Exodus, we see that 
some of the Israelites, they weren't too pleased with their situation as they were moving from Egypt to the Promised Land. In Exodus 16.3 we read, And the people of Israel said to them, Would that we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt, when we sat by the meat pots and ate bread in the, to the full. For you have brought us out into this wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. The Israelites felt like life had been better in Egypt when they knew what was right and wrong in the eyes of the Egyptians. When they understood what they needed to do to live. And they were able to have meat and have some good things even though life was very hard. You know, God was taking them out of Egypt to give them a much better life. But that required faith. Faith that God was really going to take them into this land of Canaan where they said there were giants there, there were cities with large walls, and God was going to somehow give them victory. These people who were not a military force, who didn't have proper weapons or chariots, are somehow going to have victory in Canaan. That took a lot of faith. But it was by God's grace that He was going to give them the land by their faith in Him. You see, they had a choice. Did they want to go and live by works? Trusting in what they could eke out in the land of Egypt? It was safer for some, they felt like, to know what they were going to get. As we say in Norway, you know what you've got. You don't know what you're going to get. It's a rather pessimistic statement. The idea of holding on to this because it might be worse over there. But you see, they had God's word that it was going to be better over there. And yet, out of fear and a lack of faith... Many wanted to return to Egypt. So there they were. In Exodus we see they have the choice. Do they want to return to what they know, the knowledge they have of the works they can do in Egypt, or do they want to accept God's grace by faith? So we see, not only does the tree of life point to Jesus, Moses points to Jesus. Now if we skip ahead to the New Testament... We read in the book of John, in chapter 1, now, I hope you took time this week to read the first 18 verses that I mentioned in the email that I sent out in the middle of the week. So I want to pick up in verse 19. If you haven't read the first 18 recently, I encourage you to go back after the service and do that today. Starting in verse 19, And this is the testimony of John. When the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, Who are you? He confessed and did not deny, but confessed, I am not the Christ. And they asked him, What then? Are you Elijah? He said, I am not. Are you the prophet? And he answered, No. So they said to him, Who are you? We need to give an answer to those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? He said, I am the voice of one crying out in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord, as the prophet Isaiah said. Now they had been sent from the Pharisees. They asked him, Then why are you baptizing, if you are neither the Christ, nor Elijah, nor the prophet? John answered them, I baptize with water, but among you stands one you do not know. Even he who comes after me, the strap of whose sandal I am not worthy to untie. Now, in some ways, John the Baptist was the last of the Old Testament prophets. I realize his story appears in the New Testament, but he is still a prophet in the same way that the Old Testament prophets were. And what did they do? The prophets point to Jesus. We see that illustrated here very clearly with John the Baptist, but we also see it with other prophets throughout the Old Testament. And so, the tree of life points to Jesus, Moses points to Jesus, the prophets point to Jesus. If we keep moving in the New Testament, we can look at the writings of Paul. Paul wrote to the Christians in Galatia. He said, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. In the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. So, also Paul points to Jesus. We see the Bible is about Jesus from beginning to end. The whole Bible points to Jesus. Jesus. 
It was Charles Spurgeon who said, A sermon is not a sermon until Jesus Christ has been preached. And it's true that everything that we preach about and speak about and teach about in the church somehow relates to Jesus. If it doesn't, then we're missing it. We're missing the gospel. Because Christ is at the center of the gospel. It was Martin Luther, the great reformer, who said, I must listen to the gospel. It tells me not what I must do, but what Jesus Christ, the Son of God, has done for me. You see, Martin Luther was changing the emphasis in his own life from being on what he needed to do as a result of the gospel to understanding what Christ had already done. Now, like we talked about last week, this doesn't mean that there are no works that come out of our faith. But the difference in thinking is it's not works that bring us salvation or that bring us the grace of God, because then it wouldn't be grace, it wouldn't be a gift, but rather it's works that flow out of our relationship with God. And so as we understand what Christ has done for us, then we want to go and do for Him. So with Martin Luther we see, with Bullinger earlier we see, with Zwingli and Calvin we've seen that the Reformers point to Jesus. Ultimately all of creation points to Jesus. And really, this idea is what the entire Reformation boils down to. Too much focus was on men, was on people. Whether that was priests or saints or the Pope or kings, or even a focus on you and I and our own good works. And far too little focus was on Jesus on Solus Christus, on Christ alone. God doesn't want to share the spotlight with anyone else. Not only because He shouldn't, but because it's not good for us. It distracts us from what's most important in life. It distracts us from Him and from Christ. He is the all in all. Christ alone deserves the glory. Christ alone saves. Christ alone is perfect. Christ alone has power. Christ alone sits on the throne. Now, just to clarify, I do not mean to in any way diminish from the roles of the rest of the Trinity. But what I am saying is that it's Christ alone out of that which is a part of the physical realm that we exist in and experience tangibly. It's Christ who stepped into our world, the Word of God incarnate, the Word of God taking on flesh to dwell among us. And so within that realm of existence, it's Christ alone. We read about this idea in Hebrews. If we look at the first chapter of Hebrews, the first four verses. Long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days He has spoken to us by His Son, whom He appointed the heir of all things, through whom also He created the world. He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of His nature, and He upholds the universe by the word of His power. After making purifications for sins, He sat down at the right hand of the Majesty on high, having become as much superior to angels as the name he has inherited is more excellent than theirs. And if we skip ahead just a few chapters to Hebrews chapter 4, we read in verses 14 through 16, Since then we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. So you see, the writer of Hebrews puts the emphasis on solus Christus, on Christ alone. The Reformers came to understand that, Christ, that with Christ as our intermediary, we no longer need priests to run interference between us and God. Now that doesn't mean that we don't need pastors and teachers and leaders, 
But the role of the priest in the Old Testament was one where you'd bring a sacrifice and he would offer that to God on your behalf. You didn't offer your own sacrifice under the Old Testament law, but rather, rather the priest did that for you. But we've become a kingdom of priests. We believe in the priesthood of all believers, which is taught in 1 Peter chapter 2. That because of Jesus being our high priest, he's the one that's the intermediary between us and God. And so you don't have to go to a human priest to confess your sins or to receive forgiveness or to offer a sacrifice. You go directly to Jesus as your high priest, who is the intermediary between you and God. Because of what he has done on the cross, because of his blood, God extends grace to you. He extends favor to you. He extends His power, His Holy Spirit. It's because of what Jesus has done that He has become our high priest. And so there's no longer a need for that earthly system of priests because we have a great high priest who can attend to every one of our needs. He's not limited by time and space to where He can only serve one person at a time, but all of us can present our needs to the great high priest and He'll respond to us immediately. And so... In that way, we've all become priests beneath the great high priest. And we are temples of the Holy Spirit. And so we are able to have this direct relationship with God. And as the Reformers embrace this teaching, they realize that then each believer, as a result of this, each believer is accountable to God for what he or she does with the revelation that has been given to them. So before the idea had been that, that the priests in the church, they would deal with God and then they would extend the grace of God through sacraments, through the Lord's Supper or baptism. And the people didn't need to be so concerned with, with the Scripture or even with the relationship with God as they did in following what the priest said to make sure they were right with God. But the Reformers in studying this, and again, the, the idea of the priest of every believer is foundational to the Reformation understanding that we're each accountable to God, they realize that if it's sola scriptura, if it's by scripture alone that we establish our faith and practice, then each believer is responsible to God with what he or she does with that scripture. That doesn't mean that you should interpret scripture in a vacuum and not listen to godly people who have gone before you or may have more experience or maturity or education, but it does mean that ultimately you're responsible to God for the relationship you have with Him and what you do with the revelation that He has given to you. Therefore, we can neither trust in nor blame priests, nor popes, nor parents, nor politicians for our standing with God or lack thereof. The Reformation was very much about removing that which stood between man and God to free up the connection, to free up that relationship. Now, there was truly nothing that stood between us and God, as Jesus was the intermediary for all of us at the time, but it seemed that the church had created some tradition and structures and things that had blurred that, had almost hidden Christ from the people. So my question for you this morning in closing is, what has formed your identity as a Christian? Being a Christian is not about being a part of a religion. It's about having faith in Solus Christus. Jesus is our source for what we believe and practice. Where do you put your faith, your trust, today? Are you seeking first His kingdom and trusting Him for all your needs? Seek first the kingdom of heaven, and all these things, he says, will be added unto you. Or, do you put your faith and trust in other things besides Jesus? This could be people, money, even your own intelligence. And these are all things that can serve the purposes of Christ, but our trust should be in him alone. So I'd ask you this morning, does your faith need to be refocused today? Let's pray as the praise team comes back up. God, this morning, I thank you that we can be together despite being thousands of miles apart. God, I thank you for each and every person who is here, who has come to seek your face, to seek your truth, and ultimately, hopefully, to seek Christ. And I pray, God, as they go about their week, that you bless each of them and that Christ would be real to them, and that their faith would be firmly in Him, and that they would seek His kingdom 
and His desires. Help each of us to put aside our faith and trust in other things. Sometimes it's easier to trust in those things that are tangible, that we can hold on to. But God, help us to experience the richness of your blessings that we find when we put our faith in Solus Christus, in Christ alone. And God, now may our hearts be lifted to you in our last song, and may Christ alone receive the glory and the praise. And we pray all this in the name of Jesus alone. Amen.